Hey everyone, Madrybred here. Pokemon Emerald with only poison moves was comedically difficult, especially early in the run. Let's follow that up with my first non-Pokemon challenge video in over a year. Today's the day that we figure out would I be able to beat Oblivion as a Necromancer. So I'm gonna base what we can do as a Necromancer off the actual in-game Necromancer enemies. As we can see from this list of their equipment, they wear Necromancer robes, they carry either a dagger or a mace, and often have a staff. So I'm guessing all those things are fine to equip. They also carry a lot of health and magicka potions, as well as some poisons, so I think it's safe to say that alchemy is okay. Not sure if we're gonna bother with any poison though. In terms of magic, they all have two conjuration spells for skeletons, zombies, and ghosts, as well as two destruction spells and a health restoring spell. We should be able to do that. It looks like their second destruction spell is always a version of their first spell, but more powerful, and with a disintegrate weapon and armor effects. With custom spells, we might be able to do that too, although I'm not sure if I'll need it or not. I think I should be able to use all of the undead summons though, not just the apprentice level spells. I mean, it's the necromancer run, when else am I gonna get a chance to use any of these, right? I don't know about you, but I don't think I've ever summoned any of the undead stuff past the journeyman level, so maybe that'll be a fun time. Like always, I'm writing the script as I go through with the challenge, so all this part is being written before I've started. Everyone comment down below and guess if I can win or not. I bet I can win if I power up my spells a ton, but I think that the boss battle with Mankar is going to be really hard. It's a small room with melee enemies, a rough spot to be in for a caster. Let's explain the rules. I've got to follow the equipment and spell restrictions that we went over earlier. That's basically the only major rule here. Oh, and only cosmetic mods are allowed. I'm not allowed to use any mods that affect gameplay. Lockpicking is allowed, as voted by you guys on Straw Poll. Also, if you enjoyed the video, be sure to like, subscribe, and ring the bell for more. Let's do this. So, let's start with the character creation. Right away, I take the Mage Star sign, since that gives us more Magicka. For a Necromancer class, we just went into the custom class mode and tagged all of the same skills that the actual Necromancers in-game do. So, specialization is magic, intelligence and willpower are our main attributes, and our major skills are athletics, blunt, alteration, conjuration, destruction, restoration, and sneak. Yeah, they have alteration as a major skill, even though they don't use any alteration spells. Weird, right? For the race, I went with Altmir, so a high elf. It means that we have a bit of a weakness to some elemental spells, but we also have 100 more max magicka from the start, and I think that's going to be really important. I named him Batlin after my necromancer from Warlords Battlecry 3. Yes, I still play Warlords Battlecry 3. It's awesome, shut up. So, our first steps. Well, right away I just sell the equipment that we got from the tutorial since we can't use any of that anyway. I doubt we'll use daggers since we have blunt skill as a major, but I may as well take advantage of our ability to use maces, even if we're not great at it. Other than that, we just have a heal minor wound spell and the flare spell. I guess these will have to be our basic heal and basic destruction spell for the early part of the game, at least until we can get something better. Right after that, I go hunting around near the sewers we started at. I kind of remember there's a dungeon around here somewhere that has necromancers in it, and I'm looking for necromancer robes. Not that they really do anything. I hunted around for a while though and didn't end up finding it. Maybe my memory is just failing me. Anyway, we need to be able to summon the undead if we're a necromancer. I went ahead and met up with Albrick in the Choral Mages Guild. He sells a lot of good spells. We could actually afford the summon ghost spell, so we've got something other than the basic skeleton spell. What's the news from the other parts of Tamriel? Nothing I'd like to talk about. Man, it feels good to be back to Oblivion. There's something special about the horrible cacophony of noise that happens every time more than three NPCs are in a room. I could play this for entire minutes if I really wanted to. Hi, absolutely. What's new with you? The I saw some and his three sons. Nah, I should probably make some progress. Hey, wanna go find out if these ghosts can close an Oblivion gate? Here we are at the first gate. Right away, I tried having our ghosts fight a scamp. Honestly, it never went great. I fought loads of them, and the ghosts made a decent distraction, but he was casting really weak frost spells. They'd always die in only a few hits, so I don't think this ghost is going to work out well for the Oblivion Gates. Most of the fighting ended up being either with my flare spell that they resist, or cracking out an iron mace. We did manage to find a dagger with a weak 5 frost damage enchantment on it though, so that could be helpful at some point. Let's come back with a better spell. 
Okay, so right away, I went looking for a weak lightning spell to use instead. Demons are all weak to electricity in this game, so it seems optimal. Gendover the Bravel Mages Guild had the basic spark spell, so I picked that one up. This is a novice spell, and we can cast apprentice ones, but I don't know if we could handle casting a stronger spell non-stop, so I started with the weakest one. It's still 10 shock damage, so much stronger than our flare spell that did 6 damage, but double the cost. Once getting back to Oblivion, I went straight for the first tower. This spark spell is doing great. We can 4-shot the scamps, and 3-shot the more humanoid Daedra. Nothing here hits too brutally hard outside of melee combat, so it's not too hard to keep our distance and to take them out before they can hurt us too badly. The humanoid Daedra can rush us if I don't notice them right away, but them going down in 3 hits really helps. Once we get to the top of the tower, we can pretty easily 3-shot the only dudes here. That's one Oblivion Gate down, let's hope we have a better summon spell by the next one. Okay, so once the gate went down, we easily fought our way in and found Martin, then we went back to Wayland Priory, where we had to fight off some Daedra. This part's all really easy, we can 3-shot them just like we did the demons in the Oblivion Gate. Plus, we have a lot of backup here. Like usual, we're off to the Cloud Ruler Temple, so we can start the big quest line that leads us all the way to the end of the game. You know what? That might be the least weird that's ever sounded. It still sounded weird, but it's better than usual. So the next part of the game is us meeting up with Boris in a pub to beat up some dude, then crawl through the sewers. Before that, though, I want a better undead summoning spell. This is the Necromancer run, after all. First, we need journeyman level conjuration, so unfortunately, I just have to sit around in a safe place for ages, summoning skeletons over and over. It takes a while, but it's literally the fastest way in the game to build up summoning skill, so you've got to do what you've got to do. I mean, the fastest until we can make a cheap summon spell, but that requires some upfront gold and we don't have that. Once we were at journeyman level, I went ahead and just bought the headless zombie spell. I've never used this before, but it looks like the headless zombie is way stronger than the regular ones, so this might be worth it. Let's go give it a try in the pub. Right away, I went in and blasted the guy with Spark and then let the zombie fight him. Well, it looks like it did well, but Boris was helping too, so I'm not really sure. He gives us the quest to go track down Mancar Cameron's books, so we do the usually easy stuff of getting the first few, no combat involved in any of that, and it only took a few minutes, but then we have to go to the sewers. This area is super slow and super easy since Boris can just fight everything for us. Plus, our zombie seems to one-shot everything here. There's a big fight at the end, though, where I need to take out a member of the Mythic Dawn, steal his book, then get out of there. Who knows? Maybe our summon would be strong enough that we can just take them all out and get some extra loot. That'd be cool. While I'm going through the sewers, this is a great time for this week's Chimera ad. It's still summer, so it only makes sense that we go over the short sleeve essential t-shirt from Chimera, since they're basically keeping me alive during this heat wave. They're super comfy and help keep me from overheating while I'm out there gardening. Plus, they look great, and I know they'll look great on you too. See, I can say that with confidence because they come in 13 different colors. There's no way you can't find one that doesn't look great with your style. I'm wearing the brown one while I write this because I like earth tones. If you do too, then the forced green one is also great looking. Check out the description for a link to Chimera, and make sure to use the code MADRYBREAD at checkout so that you can get a discount and let them know that I sent you. Now if you'll excuse me, I have to wade through hip-deep sewer water for your amusement. Alright, so at the other end of the sewer is the meeting with Mythic Dawn. Our zombie actually does an awesome job. The recruiter went down fast, as did both of the dudes who ran in as backup. Considering I've watched Boris lose to these guys quite a few times, it seems like the zombie really turned the tide of this battle. That means that we need to go to the Mythic Dawn base though, and I'm not really sure the zombie is good enough to win on his own. Wanna test it out on the doorman? Then you have come here to die. Well, I summoned my zombie right away, and in that short time that I took my attention away to shock the other guy down, our zombie took out Harrow. I'm still a little skeptical that it's gonna be enough for the huge fight in the meeting room, but we stand a chance.
So the first chunk of the Mythic Dawn base didn't go how I expected at all. I thought I'd be fighting alongside my zombie, but like a true necromancer, I just ended up hanging back. It turns out that we're not very visible while actually summoning our zombie, so not a single guy here saw us. Our zombies could one-shot them while they were out of their armor, and could even take on two at a time while they were in their armor. I'm feeling way better about how the meeting room is gonna go now. I didn't think I was gonna be a sneaky necromancer, but it's pretty fun so far. I'm really happy that I'm doing an Oblivion challenge again. I miss this. I'm not great at Oblivion, but I love this game. Let's go see how our zombie does in the big meeting room fight. So, this one was a weird one. Normally if you get into a fight and hear old Mankar is still in the room, he'll stop his speech early and teleport away. For some reason though, he just kept his speech going while our zombie was fighting with them. Once we cleared out the room, I went ahead and saved the priest who was kidnapped so we'd have more of a distraction as we left. The living quarters were actually the hardest part of the Mythic Dawn base for once, mostly just because there are enough enemies packed in these tight corridors that they actually saw us most of the time. A few times I had to crack out our spark spell to fight them off, and although they went down fast, our magicka was often running low. I'm planning on only leveling up once in this run so that we can do the vampire dungeon later for a Daedric artifact, so that does mean that our max magicka isn't gonna get much better. But, if we level up our Conjuration and Destruction more, then at least our spells will be cheaper to cast. It took a lot of fighting and quite a few zombies, but not only did we clear out the place, but the priest made it out alive. That's pretty cool. Next up is the Spies quest, where we're sent into town to track down... Uh, the spies. The first one ended up rushing us the moment we saw her, but she quickly got distracted with our zombie and went down. Now, we have to take out the second spy, but often we never see them and it just suddenly announces that they're dead. But after fighting a nearby conjurer who attacked us for no reason, we just saw the other spy in the distance fighting with the city guard. It turns out that the spy just goes full aggro on the city guards every single time I've played this. Attacking the city guards is a weird spying strategy, but they're the experts, I guess. Alright, before we can do the artifact quest, we need to be level 2, so I go ahead and sleep to level up. We took Intelligence, Willpower, and Speed. I figure those are probably our best options, although Endurance would have been nice too. I should explain the Vampire Quest for the uninitiated. It's been a little while. We need a Daedric Artifact to progress in the game, and this is the lowest level 1 that we can do. I mean, technically there's a level 1 artifact that we could get, but it's way harder. Azura here wants us to go track down some of her followers who have become vampires and then take them out so that they can rest in peace. Problem is, vampires are actually really hard for a level 2 character to fight, especially the leader of the vampire group. It's also a super dark cave, so I might have to do some editing magic just so that you can see, because I can hardly see in there when I am playing. Let's hope our zombies are enough to distract them, because otherwise we're gonna get ripped to shreds. At the start of the dungeon is this long corridor with very little room, so I used it to my advantage and blocked it up with a zombie. We got unlucky and three of the five vampires all got together and ganged up on our zombie. That doesn't always happen. It was looking rough at first, because they constantly knocked him back so that his attacks would miss, but every time he went down, I just summoned a new one between me and them so that they couldn't charge us. After a minute or two of this, the zombie damage started to really build up on them and he actually took all of them out. The second fight in here was the one that I was more worried about. It's a magic user and an orc vampire who has much better stats than the rest. Right away I was able to distract them one at a time with the zombie, but it didn't take long before the orc was charging after us. So I ran into the back of the dungeon behind some support beams that he often has a hard time getting past, and then I summoned my zombie right behind him to back him into a corner. As soon as he turned his back on me, we started just blasting with electricity Emperor Palpatine style until he went down. I can't believe it! I think this is the first time I've ever done this area without contracting vampirism. I didn't even die once, I always die in here. I think I didn't get vampirism just because the high elves have pretty high disease resistance, but still, that was awesome. 
With that quest down, we have the Burma Gate. It's another Oblivion Gate, this one at the doorstep of the closest city to our temple, so naturally we're gonna have to do something about it. We get back up from the local guardsmen though, so I'm not that worried. Honestly, this Oblivion Gate is pretty much a free one. The soldiers here don't always survive super long, but Captain Bird himself does, since he's got healing magic. I could just run straight though, and he'd take everything out for me, so this gives me a chance to just explore and get a bunch of free loot. I had to take the tower itself a little bit slower, since sometimes there's a lot of dudes packed into one room, but they still don't take many shots of shock to take down, and our zombie does an awesome job when backed up by Captain Bird. His faster and longer reaching sword, combined with the zombie's occasional power attacks, really works wonders at keeping everything from getting close to us. By the time we're at the top of the tower, we have lots of Daedra hearts. Hey, maybe all the money from all these hearts will be enough that I can afford to start making custom spells soon. It'd be nice to at least get a stronger summon before the end of the game. Although, now that I think about it, I probably can't make a stronger summon. I bet you I can just make it so that they last longer. Eh. Not sure if that's worth it. Next up is Sancrator, or as I like to call it, the Ghost Dungeon. This is the place where we need to fight tons of ghosts and then win a few minor boss battles with some tough skeletons. I'm not too worried though, although I'm not sure if our zombie can actually beat up ghosts. We might have to rely on shock for those, so I could see our limited magicka being an issue there. Let's just hope that the zombies can take out the skeletons. Alright, so as soon as I got in there, I summoned a zombie, watched around the corner, and check it out! Our zombies can one-shot the ghosts! Okay, well that's gonna make travel through this place a whole lot easier. Ghosts don't really spam quick melee attacks, so they probably can't knock our zombies very far away to dodge moves. That makes me feel pretty safe. Even the first skeleton went really well. Our goal is to take down all four of these guys to release the blue Jedi ghosts of old members of the Blades. Hey, did you know that Jedi can't walk through waist-high fences? I mean, Obi-Wan sat on a log in one of the original trilogies, so I guess Jedi ghosts are a physical thing. You think this is going to be a problem when he has to make it to the meeting room to bring down the barrier? You know, like, at the end of the dungeon? Hey, you need some help over there? Nah, he's, he's probably fine. Traveling through this place is always a little bit slow because of long, winding paths, but our conjuration skill is actually getting pretty high, so it's not too bad to have to resummon our zombie twice a minute. See, with conjuration, you gain skill every single time you summon something, regardless of whether the summon actually fights or not. You also gain the same amount of skill regardless of the cost of the spell, so while I travel, I usually just summon a ton of low-cost skeletons. Between that and all the zombies that I have to summon for combat, our conjuration rose pretty fast. In fact, we hit expert level conjuration while we were in the dungeon, and I really wasn't expecting that. That means that we can go learn how to summon the skeleton champion, although the wiki says that because of a bug it would be unarmed if we're below level 15 and uh, we're level 2. So, you know, I'd kind of rather keep my zombie who's cheaper and does twice as much damage as an unarmed skeleton. Anyway, the enemy skeletons in here were all really easy, so before long we got the armor that we needed to progress the plot. Next up is Miskarkand. We have a bit of a walk before we're there though. Naturally, I summon during the whole trip to get a little bit more conjuration, since it'll make our summons cheaper to cast, and I figure our zombie is going to need to be resummoned a lot by the end of the game. So, Miskarkand is a place full of zombies and goblins. They fight each other a lot. I'm sure the goblins will be a one-shot for our headless zombie, but the enemy zombies might not be. Not only that, but in the end of the dungeon, we have to fight that lich who can no doubt outrange our zombie. I'm actually a little bit worried about if we have what it takes to win that fight, but I guess we'll cross that bridge when we come to it. Alright, so Miskarkand. I was partly right about the goblin thing. Our headless zombie can one-shot most of them, but the armored up skirmishers actually take quite a few hits. We're in the second from last dungeon of the game, and finally our headless zombie is actually getting taken out pretty often. 
anytime he has to fight two zombies at a time or a group of goblins, he goes down and I have to resummon him. I still never took a hit getting all the way to the final room, but that's because I played slow and steady, hiding in the shadows while I waited for my zombie to do the work. I feel like our zombie should have a name. He's been working harder on this challenge than I have after all. Who's a famous decapitated person? You know what? <laughs> Tell me your favorite decapitated person in the comments. Bonus points if they only had one arm. <laughs> This is a weird video. All right, weird problem I ran into in this dungeon is that it's hard to know when I'm getting snuck up on by zombies, since my summoned zombie keeps making the exact same noises. I don't know how, considering our guy doesn't have a head, but I had to move real slow and squint real hard at every dark corridor to make sure I didn't walk right into danger, because a few times I almost did. It's time for the big lich fight at the end of the dungeon. This didn't go at all how I expected. Right away, I grabbed the stone we were looking for and summoned our zombie. It only took a moment for him to go running off as a zombie came running right at us, so I jumped to a platform where they couldn't get me. Now, I thought I'd have to summon ghosts to throw ice spells at them, since typically, you can't summon something down a cliff. But for some reason, I just could this time, so my zombie took out the enemy zombies. I thought that the Lich would probably have too strong of magic for our zombie to handle, but he just took him down in two hits. Not only that, but the Lich spawned with a very strong staff. It only has 16 uses, but it does 80 shock damage over the course of one second. So that's like me casting Spark eight times in one second. I should really save this for the final boss fight with Mankar. I think I'm gonna need it. Next up is the defense of Bruma, the last major step before we go into the final dungeon. We have to defend Sean Bean while some Oblivion gates open, and then we have to run into the gate and climb the tower with a 15 minute time limit. That means no easy healing by waiting around, and probably a whole lot less sneaking than usual. The battle outside is super easy, we basically don't need to participate at all to do fine, but I'm pretty worried about how the gate itself is gonna go. Wish me luck. So for the outdoor section, I just carefully jump around the edges of the lava in the middle so that we can skip over having to go in and out of the towers with the walkways. This saves us tons of time right away so that we can slow down a little bit at the main tower. Just outside of it though are some Daedra, and these ones seem to be quite a lot stronger than in the previous Oblivion Gates. Our zombies can take them down, but sometimes it takes a few summons, and I often end up joining in with our Iron Mace. It doesn't do much, but we can at least get them to lose focus on our zombie long enough to let them get free hits in on their back. If we don't do that, then our zombies will often just get blocked. Oh, and it takes three heal spells to heal back up from one of these Daedra spells, so we're pretty frail, which makes sense considering we're still just in our underwear. Inside the tower, we basically have to fight everything. I bet I could run past some of these, but they'd all start to bunch up and take us out for sure if I didn't do it perfectly. So I tried to take my time and let my zombie fight everything possible. It probably took longer than any other tower runs I've had to do in any of these challenges, but it honestly wasn't as bad as I was expecting. I was pretty worried that our zombie just wouldn't be strong enough anymore. Once we got to the top of the tower, we took out the only two dudes defending it and grabbed the sigil stone. We're almost done. Okay, so let's have a little inventory check before we are considering going into paradise, since it's kind of a point of no return for a little while. Well, we still don't have necromancer robes, but I guess that doesn't really matter considering the robes don't do anything. <laughs> I mean, other than getting you sassy comments from the Mages Guild. We have this incredible Greater Lightning Staff. I really hope that's going to be enough to blitz down Mankar, because I think that the slow speed of our zombie is going to be a problem. Considering, you know, how much Mankar loves to run away in that fight. I went ahead and picked up the Skeleton Hero spell, since it at least starts with a weapon, even if it's not as tanky as the Skeleton Champion. I was already at 88 Conjuration out of 100 by this point, so I went ahead and spent 10 minutes maxing it out so that our summons would be as cheap as possible. I was actually considering trying to beat the Mages Guild to get the Staff of Worms, which lets you actually revive enemies that you've taken out, you know, like proper necromancer style, but it would take forever to actually get the entire Mage Guild quest done, and I don't really have time for that. 
So maybe that would make for a good other challenge, you know? Maybe I like use console commands to warp in a staff of worms from the beginning of the game and we try to beat the whole game with that. Not sure that would work though, because wouldn't we actually have to take something out so that we can then use the staff of worms to revive it? I don't know. If you guys are interested in that though, then let me know in the comments section. Maybe you guys have an idea that'll make that work that I'm not thinking of. I know a lot of you watching are way better at Oblivion than I am. Hey, I never said that I was good at this game. I just said I love this game. Anyway, I'm not 100% sure that this is good enough to get us the win in this run, so I'm gonna drop a safety save before we go into paradise. All right, let's give it a try. First up is the garden, where these physically resistant raptor dudes live. For the first one, I tried using our skeleton hero, he seems to have a battle axe. Well, he won, but it took quite a few hits before he actually took something down. On the second one, I summoned our zombie instead and shot some lightning, and it went down way faster. Maybe the zombie is still the way to go, at least for one-on-one -on -one fights. It's hard to say. The boss of the garden went down super fast to a bit of electricity and our zombie, so the garden itself only took us under three minutes. On to the grotto. The first part of the grotto is super quick and easy. I think there's only two enemies in this whole section. Once we get to the lava part though, it's a little bit slower. We befriend the cultist who wants to betray Mankar, like usual, since he makes a pretty great distraction in the boss fight. We still have to fight tons of these raptors though, and it takes a while. It actually burns through a lot of our magicka since our destruction skill isn't that great. We got destruction to just under 50 by the time we were done with the grotto, so almost good enough for journeyman level spells. Not that we know any, mind you. Plus, we're only using an apprentice level shock spell, so it takes quite a few casts to take one down. Or is this novice level? I don't remember. I think it takes 8 hits to take down a raptor if I don't have my zombie backing me up, so I doubt this spell is going to be any good in the boss fight. I just hope that the staff is good enough. No, really, why is the scariest looking guy in here getting one shot by a headless zombie? Alright, it's the final path before Mankar. I've got a whole lot of weak healing potions, as well as a few that give us some mild spell resistances, so we're coming into the fight somewhat prepared. I think that the strategy is gonna just be to blast down both of his goons the second we get into the room, summon our zombie, and then just blitz down Mankar before he gets time to cast a bunch of his spells. In my experience, the longer the fight with Mankar goes, the worse it goes, because he can outlast you with those spells. He he seems to regenerate his magic a lot faster than we do at least. We need to beat him and fast. Make your final guesses on if we can win this or not. Let's do this. Okay, so the first try started great when we one-shot both of Mankar's kids. Right after though, I got one hit in on Mankar, then he casted Reflect Magic, so our next shot bounced back and one-shot us. Alright, maybe, uh, maybe a little bit of melee on try two. <laughs> Second try went really fast, so pay close attention. We blasted down his goons, then started knifing him with that weak enchanted dagger we got near the start of the game. It was hardly doing anything though, and he ended up reviving his kids pretty quickly. We were taking massive damage and guzzling down health potions when our dagger just broke on us. So I switched back to the staff to blast down his guards again. I decided to just make another shot at Mankar just in case, thinking we probably lost this run anyway, just to end up catching him right when his reflect spell effect wore off and he was at half health so he went down. I think our zombie might have hit him at the same time too, it's hard to tell in the chaos. Either way, he's down and all that's left is the raid on the Imperial City. So this part was a little weird. We fought through the first area really quick, but then everyone is supposed to run to the second area. And like, only two people did. So after going back and forth a little bit to see if they'd catch up, and they didn't, I just had to run ahead to the Temple of the One so that Dagon would spawn. Then I run back to the first area to talk to Sean Bean so that he'd follow me properly. And then we ran back to the second area. I had some fun blasting down some scamps with the last few uses of our staff, then we ran into the temple to watch the ending cutscene of the game. Man, it feels so good to get back to doing an Oblivion run. This game is always a fun time. I was kind of worried that the Mankar fight was going to be brutal, but it only took a couple tries. We seriously lucked out on getting that incredible staff. Had the Lich spawned with a less useful staff for us to take, this could have taken tons of tries. 
Maybe I'd even need to level my destruction magic more. Anyway, I really hope you guys liked that run. The next Pokemon challenge should be up next week on Saturday like usual, when I do Pokemon Emerald with only one Rattata. As always, I'm looking forward to your suggestions in the comments, in the challenge request section of my Discord channel, and on Twitter. Subscribe, ring the bell, stay tuned. Outro time! Oh, it felt really good to get back to doing an Oblivion run again. This game is just always so fun. <laughs> I'm sure part of it is just nostalgia for me, because I did used to play this in high school and everything, but man, I really love Oblivion. It's such a fun game, even with all the roughness, you know. You know the roughness. You know the leveling system in this game. Oh my god. <laughs> It's a shame that probably nobody's gonna watch this, because historically when I'd make these, very few people would, but I had a really fun time making it, so I'm not gonna complain. What I'm gonna be happy about, though, is that I've been seeing that recently YouTube has been promoting my old Skyrim and Oblivion and Fallout 3 and Fallout New Vegas challenges uh, way more than it ever did before. I don't really know why it decided to start doing that now, considering, I don't know, I haven't done one in a year, um, but suddenly it just started showing it to more people, and I'm so happy about that, because my Illusion Magic only run of Oblivion, which was my first ever non-Pokemon challenge, is literally one of my favorite videos I've ever done on my entire channel. I had such a fun time making that. So, uh, d thank you. Thank you for watching that. I'm sure probably a couple of you are here because because you recently found me through those non-Pokemon challenges, and if so, uh, thank you for subscribing, and I hope it paid off for you, because now you got to see that this video existed, and you probably wouldn't know if you didn't subscribe, because I bet you YouTube, fickle fickle YouTube has already decided that it absolutely hates me and will never promote me again. <laughs> Because that's just how YouTube is. Uh, anyway, I gotta get on editing this, because I think this one's gonna be a little bit long to edit. The, um, the non-Pokemon ones tend to take a little bit longer for me to edit. But part of it's just I have less practice with it, you know? Because I've done, like, over a hundred Pokemon challenges, and I've done, what, ten? Maybe ten non-Pokemon challenges. Maybe this is number eleven! I don't know, and I'm not gonna look it up. <laughs> Thank you everybody so much for watching, and until next time, have a nice day.